everybody. Get, go ahead and get started. Uh, just one announcement. Next week's session is in the other building. I think there are three times during the course of the whole year we got bumped into another room. So uh, we'll have people lined up at the doors here to remind you. Um, so I'm honored to have uh, Dr. Carlos Camargo. I hope I didn't butcher your name too much. Thank you. Uh, I don't know, those of you who know Boston Medicine, I first this just read that the code word of the day was Brigham and Williams and Brigham and, and women. Um, there was a time when someone from the MGH, if you told them they were from Brigham and Women's, that was quite an insult. People at the MGH jokingly looked down at the Brigham's as like a small community hospital that um, was of no note. But now they're partners. They actually partner together. I remember a partner. Um, uh, anyway, that's just a little inside information from the Harvard medical community and uh, infighting that goes on back there. I don't have your title up here, but I know it has to do with vitamin D, and uh, Drew, you can bring it up for us. Yeah. Vitamin D, acute respiratory infections and asthma. Uh, so thanks for coming all the way out from Boston. Wow, happy to be here. Good to meet you. And great. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Excellent. Okay, so we're going to take a little tour here of vitamin D, acute respiratory infections, and asthma. And you may have noticed that's contracted from the original title, which was vitamin D, microbiology, and allergy. But there's just so much going on now that I really had to shrink it down to fit within about a 40-minute, 40 45-minute, I hope, uh, talk, and then we'll have questions and answers, and I can, during that time, answer any questions you might have about food allergy, atopic dermatitis, or other areas that vitamin D has been mentioned as potentially related. I don't have any disclosures for you uh, related to this talk, um, and here's an outline of what I'll talk about. We'll start with vitamin D, sort of just general background. Some of this will be review uh, for some of you, but others will not know this, but it's, all impor it's important that we all get started on the same sort of script here, um, and what is this vitamin D story about? And then we'll dive into the, 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 the substance of the talk, which is acute respiratory infections and wheezing, asthma, and I really want to make a distinction here between incident asthma or newly diagnosed asthma versus exacerbations. People tend to just blur them. Is vitamin D related to asthma? Well, there's two questions there at least, and one of them is, does it cause asthma? And the other is, if you have asthma, is it worse? They're very different. Um, and lastly, we'll talk about randomized trials. And that's the nice thing about today's talk, which is that the field is moving into trials. So there was a lot of observational data suggesting lots of amazing associations. Now we're starting to get trials. And as usual, it's complicated. Some trials show benefits, some trials don't. Why? So we need to become better educated consumers to understand what the trials are telling us. So one slide on biochemistry. Uh, here is, as you see, the sort of different routes of getting vitamin D. Uh, and the classic route is the sun, which hits your skin and converts a, uh, a substance to uh, what you might call pre-vitamin D, which then goes to liver, gets hydroxylated. And then classically, we were taught that in the kidney, it gets hydroxylated again becomes dihydroxy vitamin D, and that's the active hormone. But what we measure is this middle one, this, this 25 OHD or 25 D. Uh, this is the circulating transport storage form of vitamin D. That's when you get a level of 20 or 30. That's what you're measuring. It's thought to be inert, doesn't have uh, effects. Uh, it has to be converted with another hydroxylation to make the active hormone. Now, what's interesting is that, unlike what I learned in med school, and probably you, you too, this last step can actually happen all over the body. There are more and more cells where they're finding that there is the enzymes and machinery to actually convert to active vitamin D. So that could be happening locally, uh, and that's a very important point. The other source of vitamin D is through diet, through supplements. The only really uh, good source of vitamin D is some deep water oily fish, 
Uh, other than that, you know, most sources of, of what that food do not have it unless they're fortified. The classic food that's fortified is milk. Uh, people realized in the 1920s and 30s that vitamin D was helpful for bone. So milk has a lot of calcium, so why don't we put some vitamin D with the calcium? And, and since the 1930s, the United States has fortified milk. But that is not the case in many countries around the world, in fact, most countries. You also can take uh, capsules and drops. And again, these all basically go down the same pathway and, and create the 25-D and then the active hormone. As I mentioned, in the 20s and 30s, <clears throat> there was really a revolution about vitamin D and, and the description of uh, this vitamin, which actually isn't a vitamin. Um, I think, let's just start there. It's a hormone. Um, if you go outside in the sun during the summer, you will make lots of this substance. And you don't need to eat anything or swallow anything to be healthy, uh, which is an important part of being a vitamin is that you need to ingest this external substance to, to be healthy, whether it's vitamin C, vitamin A, etc. D, you can make it. So it's really what's thought of as a conditional vitamin. It's only a, a vitamin if you live in areas that have low sunlight or you don't go outside, then you actually have to find it somewhere and ingest it. Well, in the 20s and 30s, this recognition of, of its own effects was, was uh, established. People had known for you know, almost a hundred years that there was some association between sunlight and, and rickets or softening of the bones, the bowing. And then in the 1920s, people discovered the substance or at least could isolate it enough that they could give it to animals and prevent rickets. And so for the next 80 years, vitamin D was all about bone. The doses were all about bone. And it was a great way to prevent rickets. And if you think about vitamin D status as going from just, you know, nothing to full. Like you're a lifeguard in the summer on one of your lovely beaches here in Puget Sound, right? You got tons of vitamin D. You're, you're, you don't need to swallow one iota of vitamin D. But what happens in between? Okay? And what we've learned over these last, you know, this last century is that you actually need very little vitamin D to get beyond rickets. Just a little bit and you're done. And so we talk about Ricketts dose vitamin D. And that was the dose recommended to Americans and everyone else in this world for you know, dozens and dozens of years, which is about 200 international units. You took 200 international units, which you'd get in two glasses of milk. You'd have enough vitamin D to not have Ricketts, nutritional Ricketts. But what about the rest of the journey to that lifeguard in the sun? or to that person working, you know, in East Africa 40,000 years ago, fishing, hunting, who was in so much sun that their skin just was black and black and black. And then as those people left Africa and headed north, and they getting into darker and darker, less sunny areas, they became whiter and whiter and whiter and whiter. What about them? You know, what happens to them when they go from this abundance of sun to North America and Seattle and Boston? Uh, and that's the story of vitamin D in the last 10 or 20 years, which is that are there effects of this hormone in that non rickets zone? Well, it helps to know that vitamin D works by binding to a receptor, and of course named the vitamin D receptor, and it's a little more complicated than, than that, but basically the vitamin D receptor is present in most tissues and cells of the body. And what's interesting is that many different cells have that enzymatic machinery to create the active hormone. We've talked about that. And they also have this vitamin D receptor. So, you know, why does heart muscle have a vitamin D receptor sitting there waiting? For what? Why? Many of, of you know, colon, uh, has vitamin D receptors. There's vitamin D receptors in the brain. There's vitamin D receptors in all kinds of different cells in the immune system. Why? There's nothing to do with all. And again, I think that is about the vitamin D hormone in a higher range than you get with 200 IU dose to prevent rickets. All right? And we now know that there's over you know, 2,700 binding sites for the vitamin D receptor along the human genome. 
and it can activate hundreds of genes. Um, so there's a lot going on here beyond just um, and sort of calcium phosphorus metabolism. And there's all kinds of studies suggesting associations with heart disease and cancer and autoimmune problems. Um, and, you know, we don't have time to go into them, but what's important is that there are, most of this is based on observational data, meaning that people with higher levels of vitamin D have less heart disease. And the challenge here is to get beyond reverse causality. What I mean by that is exercise has a lot of the same qualities. If you look at exercise, you know, like, oh, geez, exercise is associated with less hair, heart disease, less cancer. And, wow, you exercise outside, you get vitamin D. It's like they kind of travel together. And the problem is that healthy people who are outside running in the sun are less likely to get disease. But they're outside running in the sun because they don't have disease. And so it's sort of this circular thing where you're just sort of like saying, I want to find all the runners who are really healthy. Let's use vitamin D as the marker because they're probably outside, right? And they're probably healthier. So this is a conundrum because it, you know that there's going to be confounding by healthiness. And, uh, but remember that it's not, it's rarely, rarely black or white. I mean, it's, so in other words, there could be a lot of confounding, but there also could be true biology. And that was true of exercise. And there are people who dismissed exercise, ah, it doesn't have any help. Di exercise and diabetes, it's all confounding. But it actually turns out, well, it's partly confounding, but it's also partly true that if you exercise, you become more insulin sensitive, blah, blah, blah. So I am convinced that a large part of this observational data will turn out to be confounding, but there is true biology. Uh, they're not mutually exclusive. The way to figure that out is with trials. That's some of what I'll present to you shortly. But a little more about vitamin D. Why, why is vitamin D important here in North America, and, and particularly in Seattle, uh, in Boston? Uh, here's a, a map of the globe showing UV light, and it shows sort of the brightest light around the equator. You all know that. Um, you may not have ever thought about why there's more light at the equator, or why there's less sort of ultraviolet light in the poles. But if you imagine the sun hitting the earth, and you imagine that the earth just tips gently away from the sun or towards the sun on an axis. So when the earth tips away in the north, we get winter. And who gets summer? The people on the other side, Australia, New Zealand, etc., South Africa. Well, that tipping, means that when we're in winter, we're a little bit further away from the sun. And the UVB rays, as they travel that long distance and have to go now that extra little piece of atmosphere, get picked off. So above about 35 degrees latitude, so roughly a line between Los Angeles and Atlanta, you go above that line during the winter, the UVB rays are very small to none. During the summer, they're back, okay? And so if you look at the world, these guys have year-round exposure to UVB. Everything outside does not. And there are huge seasonal differences in UVB, and UVB is what makes vitamin D, and vitamin D is the focus of the stock, which is all the potential health effects. So what it tells you is that during the winter in these places, like all of North America, all of Europe, populated part of Australia, New Zealand, uh, there are potentially vitamin D issues, Chile, South Africa. So risk factors for having low vitamin D uh, are winter at higher latitudes, like Seattle, darker skin, which competes for that UV ray and basically protects you from sunburns. And it's not perfect. People who are black can get sunburn, can get skin cancer. But um, if you're very, very white, if you have a super pale complexion, you know that you're going to watch it in the sun. You're, it hits you. By the same token, you're much better at making vitamin D. What if you live indoors, work indoors, take a bus to work, never see the light? Well, you're at risk, even if you live in a very sunny area. 
Um, and that happens to us uh, as we work hard. It happens to newborns who are exclusively breastfed by a mom, has low vitamin D. They, there's no access to vitamin D. Now, the American Academy of Pediatrics recognized this about 15 years ago when they noticed a, sort of an uptick in rickets cases. Rickets cases. And they said exclusive breastfeeding moms should give vitamin D during first year of life to prevent rickets. And all you needed was a lot or a little. Just a little. Just give a little, no rickets. But what about the rest of the way? And that hormone. Now the other point is, uh, and this is a tricky one, the sunscreen. <clears throat> if you use sunscreen correctly, it is very good at blocking all vitamin D synthesis. The reality is that people don't use sunscreen correctly. They, they put a little teeny dab, like they want to save the tube, you know, throughout the entire childhood of the, their kids, you know, one tube. This is our family too. And you know, they have one little dot and they spread it. And then they jump in the pool and it's gone. I mean, so but if you apply <coughs> lots of sunscreen, you can block all vitamin D. Again, but most people don't. And just to be really clear, the sun does cause skin cancer when you know, you're exposed a lot to it. So I recommend that everybody use sunscreen on the places of highest risk, such as the nose, right, the ears, back of the neck. You should, those are, you can sacrifice the vitamin D production center at the tip of your nose, okay? So use sunscreen. But should you put sunscreen on your children before you go outside, then put a shirt on them, then put them in some sort of burka contraption as you head to the beach? Um, I, I have my doubts that that is normal or desirable. Um, but if there was a dermatologist here, they would be horrified. Uh, because any exposure to the sun is carcinogenic. You be the judge. I think there is a middle ground here uh, with some exposure that is probably healthy. Last piece is obesity. Uh, and it's important to note that in a way, we don't fully understand that if you are obese, your levels of vitamin D, at least the circulating levels, are lower. These are the circulating 25D. It also, if you're obese and you give people vitamin D, it's harder to get their levels to rise. And some people say it's because vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin, it's being stored in the fat, but it's more complicated than that. There's something weird going on with fat and vitamin D status that we don't really understand. And you have to remember that for most of human existence, as people left the Rift Valley in modern Tanzania and headed north 40,000, 50,000 years ago, there were no fat people. This is, so we got fat people living in dark areas of the world, never going outside, applying sunscreen. It's a mess. Um, and there are, in fact, many, many people with low vitamin D. But do they have rickets? No, it's fine. Really? All right, so how do you measure vitamin D? You know, you measure serum 25D. The literature is a little confusing at times because there's two measures that are in the literature. One is the nanograms per mil, which you probably use here in North America and the United States. The other one is nanomoles per liter. Now, the nice thing is the conversion is easy. It's basically 2.5. So 20 nanograms times 2.5 is 15 animals. Okay. Now, the averages, you know, differ in countries. Uh, they differ by other factors like race, etc. In the United States, the the average is about 22. All right. It's probably a little lower in in Seattle, uh, here in the north, with lots of cloud cover, and uh, it's harder to be exposed to UVB. And during the winter, you don't have any. If you were crazy enough to lie naked on the roof of this building at noon every day during the winter, you would make no vitamin D, none. You would also be arrested and put indoors. <laughs> and you'd definitely make none. So people in Seattle either need to go outside a lot during the summer, build up, store that in their fat. You know, you don't have to have a lot. And then use it during the winter. Then here's the spring, here's another summer. But if you worked all summer, you didn't go outside, you just, you know, religiously avoided the sun because your dermatologist said that it's genocide to go into the sun. And I actually had somebody once say at a talk who accused me of being genocidal. And I said, like, like 
Pol Pot and Stalin and Camargo? You know, all of us? So, anyway, well, I digress. But you would basically, you know, you do need to think about vitamin D in this environment. Um, so what's adequate, what's inadequate? Well, of course, uh, there are, as you've heard, many different standards. Uh, some people think that having less than 10 is, you know, that's the problem. That's really low, that's where you get rickets. Most groups think less than 20 is a problem. But that's based almost entirely on vote data. That's important to know, that the, the, the level could be different for something like bone, which is a skeleton, or like the scaffolding of your body, versus the vigilance required to prevent infections. Think about that. It could, it could be different for this hormone. Um, now, many researchers in vitamin D look at less than 30. And then some researchers, really kind of on the extreme, think that less than 40 is the level. Uh, and they are definitely the minority. Now, with all these levels, and the average American at around 22, you can imagine, all you got to do is change the level and create a crisis. So I, I just changed the definition. Now there's, my God, it's a deficiency in the United Or, you know, just push it down or up and to, no, no, don't worry, you're all fine. And that's what you read in the newspapers. Different levels with different levels of alarm. But what's optimal? Well, the IOM, when they said less than 20, they didn't mean that 21 was optimal. They just meant that, well, there's no benefit of bone. There's a benefit to bone at 21, 22. So we don't know what to tell you. We need trials. We need more research. So even the IOM group probably would agree that more than 30 is better than 21 or 22. They're not going to tell somebody who's 22, hey, go indoors. You've got to lower your level. You're starting to get toxic. Okay? Nobody says that. So let's go back to Tanzania. What are their levels? If you go in Tanzania right now, you, you know, collect a group of fishermen, uh, you know, and they're not, they don't want it sun tanned. I mean, they're not sitting out there trying to get sun exposure. They're just living. Hunter gatherers, you just measure their levels. What are they? They're in the 40 to 60 range. So that's disturbing for a society that's 22. You know, these people, are 40 to 60, we're 22, bones are fine, check, let's keep going. That's the focus of my research, and I focus mostly on infection. Well, the bone story is what drives us, because that's where the data is, and here are the latest Institute of Medicine uh, recommendations that basically adults, as you can see, should have 600. Now, the good news is that's more than it was recommended in 1997. So they do, did recognize that we needed more than what was said before. However, you know, it was definitely, there aren't any other non-bone data that are useful, and so we just need more work. Now realize that as you consume vitamin D, there's a rule of thumb, and it's very rough, but for every 100 I use, you basically go up by one nanogram per mil. So if you ate or consume 600 I use, whether through fish or through supplements, you'd go up about six. So if you really want it to be 40 or 50, you never get there with these recommendations. And if you started off at 10, and you did this, no, not gonna get there. So this is very conservative, and it's again, trying to prevent rickets. And if you read the document, it's all about bone. Is there a agreed upon dose that's clearly toxic, that you can go too high? Yeah, so the, the 10,000 10, or more is thought to be bad. Like if you had 10,000 every day, you would eventually get into problems. You've got the serum level. Yeah, well, you would start to get serum levels go higher and higher and higher, and then the classic risk factor or the or evidence of harm would be hypercalcemia and all that follows with hypercalcemia, just like any other patient parathyroid disease and cause cancer. So then you pull back and say, well, what do you feel safe about? And what people feel safe about is a maximum of 4,000. And that's the Institute of Medicine recommendation. That's the upper limit, 4,000. But they recommend this dose that, that should work for the vast majority of the population to do what? To get them to 20 so that their bones are okay. And that's, you got to understand, that's the goal. So 4,000 units supplemented per day, 
is, is the upper limit. Upper limit of safe. Yeah, and I'm going to disqualify that because what if you absorb more, you absorb less? Okay, so little digression. Um, what is the right dose for a human? How would you study it? Well, people did a really nice experiment a few years back where they took uh, uh, guys in, the, in these nuclear submarines. Okay, these guys go down for three months. You could actually measure their blood. You could just watch their 25D, bum, 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 just like a sub. <laughs> Going right down. And then they figured out how much they needed to give them to maintain that level. And it was about 3,300 IUs. So imagine that you get out in the sun a little bit, and then you consume something else. You could be 3,500, 4,000. You're probably going to be fine. If I'm a lifeguard, how much do I need to eat? None. Wait, I'm a lifeguard in winter in an indoor YMCA. More. Well, how, see, so it's a, you're, you're doing this math of trying to get around 3,500 to 4,000, but it's going to depend on the UVB, it's going to depend on your diet. And really, for the sun exposure, it doesn't have to be that long. It's only like 10, 15 minutes a day, right? Yeah, so the comic was that the sun exposure doesn't have to be that long. It's 10 to 15 minutes. True, but that's assuming you're very white, very pale. If you're an African American, you have to be out in the sun about you know, five times as long. So 15 minutes times five, 75, that's a pretty long break in your shorts without a shirt on the roof. <laughs> so, so remember, a lot of interactive with Dave says, you're right, but think multi cult, you know, think diversity, think Africa, think uh, you know, Hispanic, Native American. Yeah. How long the oral preparations absorb? Because we use a 50,000 unit capsule and we need two or three a week. These people still don't raise their vitamin D levels yeah. very fast. So the question is about vitamin D absorption. And I don't want to get into that yet. We'll, we'll tackle that during the, the question and answer. But the, the brief answer is that um, people differ in how they absorb. I can tell you my own story, how poorly I absorb vitamin D, so why I take more vitamin D. But I had a research lab, you know, measuring levels, uh, doing all kinds of crazy stuff. But, I mean, I absorbed about 15 20% of it. Think about that. I mean, that's pretty bad. So people say, oh, well, don't use the sun because it's too vague. You don't really know what you're getting. Well, it's not that much better when you swallow it. I mean, it probably is better, but it's still iffy. Okay, so let's keep going. So here is the, the, the infection allergy part of it. If you go back more than 100 years, um, there was this very uh, creative guy, uh, Neil Spinson, and he... Uh, was from the Faroe Islands. I don't know if you know those in the North Atlantic, very dark, cloudy. And he was convinced that sunlight was a very important part of health. And he began doing work where he would have a, like a lamp that was like the sun and he would use it to treat various infections. And this is a paper from the British Medical Journal over a hundred years ago, uh, looking at the effect of red light on smallpox. And he did all these different studies on heliotherapy, heliosun, sun therapy. Now, his big success was in tuberculosis of the skin. And this next slide shows a patient with tuberculosis of the skin who then got this lamp treatment and how she improved. Now, this is before any, any you know, treatments with anti-tuberculous drugs or basically UV radiation to this young woman led to a dramatic improvement. A Nobel Prize to this scientist and an idea that maybe light has something to do with infection. Now, it could just be the property of the light itself is killing the organisms. And maybe creating vitamin D. And maybe vitamin D is helping. You know, it could be lots of things going on. But this is kind of, I would mark as the start of, of, of this serious interest in vitamin D and sunlight. Now, this continued um, into the 20s and 30s where they have these these health clinics for tuberculosis around the world. And this is a one, I think it's in, uh, in the Alps. All these kids have tuberculosis. They would go up there during the summer. They would lie outside and the doctors would pull back the sheets a certain amount every day according to these complicated regimens to expose them to small amounts of UVB light to create vitamin D. But what was interesting was they knew not to just throw them into the sunlight because that 
did not work. They had to somehow just do sort of regular dosing increments. Uh, there were concerns. You can read these old texts about, you know, that you have to dose this right. It's a, it's, you know, it's, it's a, remember, it's a hormone, and, you know, you don't want to be hyperthyroid. You don't want to be hypothyroid. Back to your dosing question, you know, we're getting 50,000 IUs per week. Well, maybe that's okay. How about 500,000 once a year? Does that resemble any activity known to humans and the sun? No, it's bizarre. It's like hurtling someone into the sun. I mean, what? it doesn't make any sense. Why would you think that's good for you? Um, so dose matters, frequency matters, and even back here in these clinics, these TV clinics, uh, they were thinking about these issues. In the 1940s, anti-tuberculous drugs come out. All of this just gets swept away. Now here we have the drug, it goes right after the organism. We don't need this anymore. Uh, and then it's basically over until the 90s uh, and early 2000s when again, this infection theory starts to emerge. Now we know that there is a nice, very nice review in Nature Review of Immunology now five years ago showing all the effects that vitamin D has on the immune system. And I'll just mention one, which is the effect on catalocytin. Which is an antimicrobial peptide, as you all know, part of innate immunity. Uh, and you know, only in 2005 was it found that if you basically look at the gene that makes capsaicin an antimicrobial peptide, um, that it's a direct target of vitamin D receptor, and that it's upregulated by the hormone vitamin D. And you can see here all the different uh, substances that have tried to stimulate production of capsaicin, and there's the active hormone. I mean, there's no question. The active hormone stimulates production of catholicidin in various places of the body. Where do you have this production? You have it on your skin, you have it in your airway, you have it in your gut. All the areas in which a human being interacts at some level with the outside world. Which, you know, makes sense. But I want to remind you of those places, right? The airway, respiratory infections, skin, topic dermatitis, gut, food allergy. Those are the links that I think are, we're going to discover in the next few, few years. Um, and cathelicidin and the bacteria, whether they're pathogenic or not, microbiome, I think that is going to be the way this all comes together. Well, I got involved in this uh, now five, uh, what more, uh, seven years ago when um, I took an interest in this vitamin D story and infections. and. In a birth cohort in Boston, we looked at the amount of vitamin D that women consume during their pregnancy, and then the risk of their children, not them, but their children, wheezing during early childhood. And we found this really nice association where you, basically the more vitamin D the women consumed during pregnancy, they gave birth, and then their children would be at higher or lower risk of wheezing during early childhood. And you know, we wondered, wow, is this potentially related to less infections, right? Because kids wheeze a lot. And, you know, it's a, mostly just respiratory infections. Could it also be asthma? So some colleagues then went on a, on a bit of a binge here um, and wrote a series of papers. Um, is vitamin D deficiency to blame for the asthma epidemic? Uh, maternal diet versus lack of exposure to sunlight as the cause of the epidemic. And lastly, childhood asthma is a fat-soluble vitamin D deficiency disease. Um, there was no data between that publication and all of these reports. There's a lot of enthusiasm, um, and I don't agree with it. Uh, I thought from that first paper that there might be something about asthma, but we really need to look, but also that most wheezing is not asthma. It's respiratory infections. So I kind of went a different way. Um, and one of our next papers was looking at vitamin D in recent URI, and we published this paper in the archives of maternal medicine, where in every season you saw the same association where people with higher um, vitamin D levels were at lower risk of having a recent URI. This is observational data, but it wasn't just that in the winter you're low and you have infections. It was in every season you saw the same gradient. To me, that was pretty nice data controlling for this winter URI found. But 
better was uh, off in New Zealand, I went, and there was a, a big birth cohort there with cord bloods. We thawed them, checked 25D status, and what we found was that compared to kids who were 30 plus in the cord blood, um, that kids who were less than 10 were more than twice as likely to have an early life infection. Now this is, you know, observational data. You could argue, oh, that's probably just because it's winter. We control for winter, spring, summer. We look within seasons. It was there. There's no question that if you have a, uh, a very low vitamin D level at birth, you're more likely to be infected in those first months of life. And then we confirmed the wheeze finding from Boston with cord blood. So actual vitamin D status, not just what they ate. But at age five, nothing but asthma. So to me, this was really the response to our first paper, which was that in choosing between respiratory infections and causation of asthma, it seemed really about respiratory infections. Well, in the years since, there's been several reviews. Um, there was, uh, in terms of acute respiratory infection, there's now 25 studies in this report. These are systematic reviews. Um, and the majority report significant associations between vitamin D status and risk of respiratory infections, but it's very heterogeneous. In terms of incident asthma, uh, again, many studies, uh, there's an association with wheezing, but the two cohorts that have looked directly at vitamin D and causation of asthma find no association. So there's actually no data right now that vitamin D is associated with incident asthma. It's always wheezing or lots of wheezing or told me they had asthma and they're also wheezing, but doctor diagnosed, confirmed asthma, there's no data. And that story even gets more complicated because if you look at this association with vitamin D, there's actually a curvilinear um, quality here. Um, this first study was from the United Kingdom, a large sample of adults. And what they found, if you look at IgE level is that if you're really low, it's high, and then it drops, 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 and then as you get to around 50 or higher, it starts to take off. You know, people looked at the, oh, that can't be right. Well, it's just like every other hormone. You don't want to be hypothyroid. You don't want to be hyperthyroid. You want to be euthyroid. Every hormone is like this, and I think vitamin D is no different. And so earlier, we talked about toxicity, and hypercalcemia has always been the marker. And I'm going to predict that in the next years, another marker is going to be sensitization and allergy. That that's going to happen before hypercalcemia. Um, and where is that threshold? I don't know, but somewhere 50, 60. You don't want to be too far along that path. So if you just give everyone large doses of vitamin D, including the woman who's a lifeguard in the summer, that's not smart, I don't think. We will see. Now we did a, I was very interested in this topic, and so the one place in the United States where they get a lot of sunlight and the vitamin D isn't too bad is in Arizona. And so Ann Wright there um, and I talked and, and basically we thawed the blood from one of their cohort studies and we looked at the relationship between cord blood 25D and, and then subsequent bloods also. And what we found was that low and high 25D was associated with aeroallergen sensitization. We found the same curvilinear association. And what was interesting was that incident allergic rhinitis was curvilinear, but not yet significant. Remember, we only had 219 kids, so the PVI was 0.09. Asthma was completely null. There was no association between cord blood 25D or 25D at one year and risk, uh, you know, subsequent years and risk of developing asthma. Now, at this point, before we go into those final trials, you know, I, I, I want to emphasize that I think that vitamin D could be very important for asthma. I keep telling you that it doesn't sound like it's a cause of asthma. But when people have asthma, what makes it bad? How do you lose control of asthma? Well? <laughs> Respiratory infections. So if you could lower respiratory infections in an asthmatic, that would be a huge advance. Um, and so that's where we're heading with this story. Now, there are many different types of study designs uh, from the week, you know, case report, which can be very helpful. 
two randomized trials, which are very powerful for causal inferences, but very limited because they have one dose, you know, one thing that varies, and special patients, and you all know from the allergy literature, I mean, people who participate in our trials you know, tend to be unusual. Uh, you know, here, check the peak flow, morning and night, you know, for six months. And take, I mean, come on, so people, normal patients don't do that. Who, who signs up for these trials? People who love vitamins, <laughs> okay? And so what happens when you enroll people into a vitamin trial in the United States where they have access to vitamins, their doctors reading about vitamin D, they, they just checked on the internet that they should have this 25 zero HD check. <laughs> so people go into trials and they say, yeah, I might get vitamin D for the next few months and or years or I might not. I'll ask my doctor to check my level. If it doesn't change, I'll just start taking the vitamin D. It's a mess. So one of the reasons why I'm really nervous about trials in the United States, or Europe for that matter, is that people who are in these trials want to be on vitamins. And so when you randomize the placebo, there's a real risk that they are going to get contaminated by taking their own vitamins that they can get at any store. I can go to any store, that vitamin store in Seattle and get 5,000 IUs, 4,000, 10,000. You cannot do that in Mongolia. <laughs> you cannot do that in New Zealand. And in most, like in Canada now, it's very hard to get a 25D level checked because governments are clamping down and they're saying there's way too much testing. We're not paying for that anymore. So actually trials are moving offshore because the patients are unable to basically interfere with the randomized double-blind placebo control trial. Whereas in the United States, it's tough. So two trials of relevance here. Does vitamin D during pregnancy predict risk of incident asthma, right? And there's one from Denmark. Um, characteristics are shown here. 2,400 daily during pregnancy. These are Danish women. I bet you they're all low and I bet you they're gonna bump their levels, and then we're gonna to look to see whether or not it causes asthma, but wait, we're not. We're actually looking at recurrent wheeze at age three years. That's not asthma. So if this shows benefit, I'm still gonna maintain that that's actually respiratory infections. But what's curious about this trial is that they gave it during pregnancy only, and then during infancy and beyond, nothing. So I'm expecting that there might be a benefit in the first months, and then nothing. And everyone's gonna say, oh, vitamin D, bust, it's over. Big trial, nothing there, go home. Next trial is here in the United States by my colleagues at the Brigham. Uh, Scott Weiss and Gus Latanjua wrote all those reviews. Um, and here it's the same design, bigger dose, 4,000 I use during pregnancy, not during childhood. <clears throat> And the outcome, again, is recurrent weeks. Now, both of these trials should be released in the next year or two. And again, I think they have the same issues. Which is, I, you know, I'd want to give vitamin D during pregnancy, yeah, but then continue it during infancy and prevent the respiratory infections during infancy and, and potentially change the immune system as it's being exposed to the world and, and learning how to adapt to all these antigens that are being presented to it. Now, to interpret these RCTs, we talked about some of the things, but here's a list to help guide you. There's age differences. I mean, do we really expect that infants with this hormone are gonna be the same as adults? The baseline level, you know, why would you expect somebody with a high level of vitamin D to benefit from taking something? You wouldn't. So if you look at a trial and there's already high levels at baseline, it's gonna be null or bad. Genetic factors, we haven't even talked about them. And that whole area of vitamin D receptor polymorphisms, D binding protein is big. And I think you're gonna see a lot more on, on sort of differences that this guy will get benefit from vitamin D, this gal won't because of their genetic constitution. And then comorbidities, you know, do they have asthma? Do they have immunodeficiency? The regimen we've talked about also, you know, is it really the same to compare giving 400 IUs versus 2000? I mean, the vitamin D study showed it's totally different. Frequency, daily, monthly, annual, duration. You know, if you give it for less than three months versus a year, it's gonna matter. 
And then adherence with protocol I talked about, that probably is the biggest challenge for these vitamin trials, is just people breaking the protocol, largely in the placebo group, which is kind of unique. Because, you, you know, you put them in a drug trial and they can't just go out and buy some sequestinite, right? And start taking it because they think it's good. Whereas they definitely can do that with vitamins. So here's a trial that I did in Mongolia. Um, and this is a, you know, randomized trial. It was embedded within a large trial of 744 children. Um, basically, what we did was we looked at a subset of 247 kids that were randomized to two arms, very similar. Both of them got milk every morning at school. Uh, some of the milk had vitamin D, some of the milk did not. And the primary outcome was reporting a respiratory infection during the winter. Now these kids started at seven nanograms per mil. They were very low. So this is, you know, if you can't make a difference here, game over. The intervention boosted them to 19, which still is low, but it's a big bump. And it's a much bigger bump than you would have predicted by my rule of 100 IUs bumps by one, because they're so thirsty, so hungry for it, that at that lower level, you get bigger bumps. And what we found was literally a halving of risk of respiratory infection in these kids. So if you're very low and you get vitamin D daily, you have half the amount of respiratory infections. So randomized, double-blind, placebo control trial. To me, you know, okay, game on. We, we got something here. About six weeks later, we published another paper on bolus dosing. Now, this is 322 healthy adults and um, from New Zealand who are all interested in vitamins. And we wanted to be sort of efficient. We used more of a public health approach, giving 100,000 once a month, you know, because that would help the adherence. You know, once a month, you got to do this. They'll all do it. Um, and then we looked at URI episodes. Now there, we discovered to our disappointment at the end of the trial, when we thought the blood and looked at everything, that the average was 29 nanograms per mil at baseline. Oh, <laughs> big trial. Now you could say, well, you dummy, why didn't you measure it when you were enrolling them? Because if we measured it when we were enrolling them and they came in at seven, or nine, I can't randomize them to placebo for 18 months. You can't randomize people with a disease called vitamin D deficiency to not get vitamin D. So these trials take the blood, freeze it, check it later, but it would be wise to do the trials in places where there'll be large numbers of people with vitamin D deficiency, right? Without access to vitamin D, without having their doctor check their level, etc. That was Mongolia not New Zealand. In any case, we did bump them up from 29 to 50. And we did answer a question, which is, does that increase make a difference to URIs? No, totally null, published in JAMA. So these are two papers on which I participated within six weeks of each other with wildly different, supposedly different conclusions. And I had the press, you know, calling me like, oh my God, you found the cure for the common cold. Six weeks later, I hear vitamin D is useless. Like, well, it's complicated, you know. <laughs> you don't want that. They want to know exercise, good, bad. Vitamin D, good, bad. Well, you know, exercise to the point of fractures. and <laughs> So, you get it. Well, here's a review of all of these acute respiratory infection trials. There's the Mongolia study, the New Zealand study. But the overall estimate shows a decrease in risk of acute respiratory infections from taking vitamin D in populations that tend to be lower and more frequently dosing it to make it more sort of like normal exposure to the sun. That's kind of the trends that are emerging. What about asthma exacerbations? Well, there are observational data that also suggest benefit. There, if you have low levels, you tend to have more exacerbations, just like in the ARI literature. And there are trials now. Uh, in Japan, there's a trial of 430 children getting 1,200 IUs per day. A subset of them had asthma. The kids in the vitamin D group had less asthma exacerbations. There's another trial in Jackie. Uh, you know, it's around 50 kids. They got vitamin D. They had less exacerbations. And then this year, Mario Castro and the Asthma Net published the, the vit big vitamin D study in JAMA. Um, 408 adults. They started with 100,000 bolus. So, boom. And now you get 
sort of like for a couple of months, you have this large amount of vitamin D. And then they went to 4,000 IUs per day for 28 weeks, and they found nothing. Now, it's very important. The primary outcome was tying to first treatment failure. So they're looking at first treatment failure, and it's a really a lot of a composite of different types of ways that you might you know, fail your treatment. And when you look at the graph, it looks just null. I mean, hazard ratio 0.9, you can see there's just nothing going on. And maybe there's some splitting after the first few months, but at least initially, there's just nothing. Now, is that because of that bolus and this definition, which is, you know, sort of emphasizing the first? Well, in the same paper, which was widely declared as null, there's this graph. Um, and this is the total number of exacerbations. In other words, taking that same level, that same outcome as before, but tightening it up to really, like you needed to get steroids, you needed to, you needed to deuce your albuterol doses by twice as much. Like everything is just like more like a real exacerbation. And here, the p-value is 0.05, and the hazard ratio is 0.63, which is exactly like that systematic review of all those trials of ARI and I would contend that the more important outcome for clinicians is not time to first treatment failure, it's exacerbations over the next half year. And that's what I'm interested in, and that's what most people are interested in. And this study basically takes this finding and sort of just pushes it to the side and says more research is needed. Our primary outcome of first treatment failure was null, the study is null. So that was annoying. Um, but again, I look at the study as confirmatory of a lot of the things that we're saying. The last piece of this puzzle is inhaled steroids. In that trial, what they did was that everyone got cyclosinide, and then they added vitamin D to see if it would work as an adjunct tube inhaled steroids. Now, you might off the bat say, whoa, that's a tough challenge. You give people inhaled steroids, and then you're supposed to do better than inhaled steroids by extra? Yeah, I think it's a reasonable challenge if you prevent infections and help with control through that method. But there is a body of literature that says that actually when you're low in vitamin D and then you replace the D, you make the inhaled steroids work better. Okay? And this started almost 10 years ago in London where the group there found that addition of vitamin D3 would overcome low corticoid responsiveness um, by inducing IL-10. <coughs> In other words, dexamethasone induced IL-10 and its cascade impact on the subjects and the conclusion that glucocorticoid resistant or less sensitive patients would benefit from getting vitamin D. So this is clinical and laboratory work. In Colorado, they continued this theme with publications in, in the Blue Journal and Jackie showing that low 25D was associated with worse severity and better in vitro response. Now, the severity could be confounding, and who knows? I mean, it's, again, people who are running around in the sun are help. Okay, well, that's not shocking. But in vitro, if you gave the vitamin D, it looked like the glucocorticoid worked different, better. Another observational study in the Blue Journal shows that if you start with low vitamin D, that you get less boost from your ICS. But this is all observational data. What we need is a trial. The Castro trial comes in, the null study in JAMA a few months ago. In the null study, this randomized trial, randomized double-blind placebo control, the vitamin D group, in fact, required a lower overall dose of side to maintain control. Now, it's a very small difference. You could argue that that's trivial, but it was statistically significant, identical to all of this preparatory work, uh, and I think it suggests that there really is something there. Now, how do you maximize that? How do you optimize that? To so the people from pharma in the audience here, I mean, to me, this is something that we've been talking about for a long time. Like, what is this interaction between the glucocorticoids and vitamin D? How does that work? And here you're getting signal that there's something important. So not only could vitamin D reduce risk of respiratory infection, but it might actually improve the inhaled corticosteroid effectiveness. And again, this was in that... A paper by the Asmonec group a few months ago in JAMA. To answer this, we need 
big trials. There are two trials, uh, several trials going on around the world. These two I'm involved in. One is in New Zealand. Uh, I'm co-PI, 5,000 people. We chose a public health model, which I kind of regret right now, but again, we will answer a question. 100,000 once a month. Uh, does that improve cardiovascular outcomes, infection, fractures, etc.? My hunch is that if your vitamin D is low enough, it's better to get 100,000 once a month than nothing. But for the person who's 20, 22, I think once a month it's not going to help. And there's sort of an emerging feeling, a mix of, between the, 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 the endocrinologists and, and the rest of us who work in this area that it's probably not smart to drop a bomb of a hormone on somebody and then their body, think about all those receptors and the enzymes. It's sort of in this, ah, there's lots of vitamin around. Why don't we disappear, slow down, and then it fades away. And what are you left with? A more deficient state than you started with. And, and so this bolus dosing is starting to go under a lot of criticism because it actually could be creating a more deficient state at the cellular level. But we committed to this trial, and again, I, we'll see what we find. Um, the other big study is the VITAL study, 26,000 people, um, and here uh, it's daily dosing in the United States, and, and I'm the PI of the infectious disease R01 associated with this, so we're going to look at vitamin D and respiratory infection, sepsis, etc. It's daily dosing. It's in the United States. So you're going to have people, you know, taking vitamin, you know, in placebo group, and it's going to be messy. So we'll see. Um, those trials will not be done until 2016, 2017, at the earliest, and vital now is 2018. So to summarize, um, low vitamin D levels as measured in the blood, 25 OHD, are associated with more ARIs, more wheezing, more exacerbations. There's little, if any, association with incident asthma. There may be sort of less corticosteroid responsiveness among people with low D. I have concerns about using high doses in pregnancy and in infancy because of that curvilinear association. If you had women who were at sort of normal levels and then you gave them vitamin D doses, you would push them up the hill towards higher risk of syrup sensitization. There are multiple trials underway. They're all going to start emerging in 2014 through 2017, but I caution you that some of these null studies are not really null. It's just complicated. Um, the trials so far on ARI are mixed, but I think they support benefit. Um, Low levels with daily dosing reduces risk of ARI. If you had a patient who came to your clinic and had a level of 10 nanograms per mil, and you put them on daily vitamin D for a couple of months during the winter, the evidence suggests that they are less likely to have respiratory infection, and they will therefore achieve better asthma control. I, I think we're ready to do that. If they have higher 25D and you give them bolus dosing, no benefit. You just then why? You know, if, if they have a normal level of vitamin D, why are you supplementing them? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. But we do this all the time in trials, and then we're shocked when the vitamins don't work. Um, individual patient data meta-analyses are underway. Um, we've created a collaboration with over 20 trialists around the world. All of them, 100% have agreed to give their data from their trials into a uh, common source, uh, and what we're going to do then is look at all these issues, the dose, the frequency, the baseline level, and try to then, with this large database of thousands and thousands of people, try to figure out, well, who gets benefit, who doesn't? Uh, and so that's underway, and it's funded by Grant in the UK, um, on which I'm involved. And so last word here is just, you know, while well, people always want to know, what's the best level? What should you shoot for? And I shoot for 35 to 40. Um, if somebody was 30, would I tell them to take a supplement? Probably not. I wouldn't want to mess with it. I, I don't think there's any evidence that going from 30 or higher helps you. I mean, trial evidence, there's none. Observational data, too easy to be confounded. But if you're taking vitamin D and you're shooting for a target, I would shoot for 35 to 40, which is actually lower than the Tanzanians. The reason I say that is because you will eventually go on vacation in the Caribbean or somewhere nice. You will eventually go in the sun. And so I want to have some buffer 
so that when I get that sunlight, I'm still within the normal human range, okay? The other thing is that at some point you get tired of taking your medicines. And if you plummet, I'd rather plummet from 35 to 22 than 60 to 22. Because when you drop from 60, when you stop taking your bolus dose that you got on a fad, and you drop to 22, I'm pretty sure your body's gonna think that you're very deficient. And this gets back at that idea that a hormone, you know, be careful because you could create a relative deficiency at different levels. So um, if you have a patient with a level of 10, 15, it's easy. Treat them. Uh, 20, treat them. 25, I treat them. 30, well, it's starting to get, what time of year is it? 30 at the end of the summer, treat them. 30 at the end of the winter, leave them alone. With that, I'll stop and take any questions. Thank you. So this is implicit in what you just said, but we should measure it in everyone. The question is, should we measure it in everyone? And I think that um, in some places that makes sense. If you were working in an allergy clinic in Nome, Alaska, um, and you didn't check vitamin D, I would be very curious why. Um, in Seattle, I think in the fall and winter, yeah, I would check. Um, you're gonna find levels are low. Now, if you have an African-American with poor asthma control, lots of respiratory infections, and it's December, January, I, I think it would be strange to not check it. Why would you not check it? We have a safe, cheap, probably effective treat to help reduce the risk of respiratory infection in that person through randomized double-blind controlled trials. So now it's summer, person's in excellent control, they read about vitamin D to see if they can get another slight edge on their superb control. Well, I don't know. It's, that's where the insurance companies are starting to say, stop, this is expensive, and there's no evidence of benefit in that person. Other questions? Is the vitamin D metabolism similar in animals? And if so, what do you know, animal studies show, either primate or non-primate? So the question is, is, animal, is vitamin D metabolism similar in animals? And if so, what do they teach us? And uh, vitamin D is actually found in all different animal systems. Um, and there is a very interesting literature on, on vitamin D in animals uh, where you, you know, animals are, out, animals are not trying to protect themselves from skin cancer. Uh, they're just outside, walking around. And, and it, even in places where, you know, you, you know like there's a, there's a great anecdote, to give you one example of many out there about the importance of vitamin D for health, which is polar bears. Uh, polar bears are sort of introduced into zoos, right? You know, novelty, wow, a polar bear. And, Polar bears have long periods of sunlight, right? That's summers, nonstop sun, right? And they're making vitamin D, all right? And then they have long periods of dark, and they're living off that vitamin D. But if you take a polar bear and you put them in a zoo in Berlin, and they're inside a concrete bunker, and they come out, and they're not necessarily eating the right food, the foods that they ate, these fish and other things that they used to eat, Instead, they're getting rickets level dosing, if that. What happens? Well, there was around the world, polar bears would jump off their structures and break bones. And so people started, the, the veterinarians started checking vitamin D levels in them, and there was basically uniform deficiency in all these polar bears. So they started giving larger doses of vitamin D to these polar bears to basically help with their bone structure and bone fractures. Um, but this was a you know, big issue in the vet, in the zoo world, uh, which is polar bears with vitamin D deficiency. So, so we can learn a lot. But I think at the end of the day, it gets back to this issue, which is there are a few fundamentals in life, and there are rare exceptions, but as a general rule, most living things on this planet need two things to live, water and light. And we're probably not different. Yeah. I mentioned earlier about food allergy. I mean, is there any, what's the literature there? So food allergy right now is mostly observational data. And then 
laboratory-based data, which can get very confusing with suggestions of benefit and harm and everything in between. The, the strongest data for food allergy talks about how children born in the fall and winter tend to be more likely to develop food allergy. We describe this in Boston, we confirmed it in Australia, and we've now seen it in multiple cohorts around the world. And there's really no explanation for why, you know, it's sort of weird. I mean, your kids are five years old with peanut allergy and, oh, it looks like you're more likely that you were born in November. And so the theory is that when people are born into those sort of darker months, to a mom who probably is borderline low anyway, an average American, Australian, sort of low level. The kid's born with kind of a lowish level. They don't get any extra vitamin D. And then they're sort of traveling in darkness while they're exposing themselves to foods. That's the hypothesis. And we wrote about this in Jackie uh, in a big review a few years back. Um, so the, if you had low levels, in theory, you would be less tolerant of antigens and more likely to to become allergic, sensitized and allergic. The problem with food allergy is that, what if that's true for peanut, but not milk? What if it's true? I mean, food allergy is not even a category. I mean, it's like, right? I mean, egg, milk, you get it, it goes away. Why does it go away? Could that be related to vitamin D? Could it be that these some of these childhood allergies go away because kids now are mobile and getting out? And, getting outside and exposed to other allergens. And so there's a lot of uncertainty. There, there are observational studies, many of them suggesting that season and vitamin D levels are related to the higher risk of sensitization, possibly allergy. Um, and there's also a little literature talking about genetic differences and how it's true in one group but not another. Um, I think given the few <coughs> clues that we have, it's one that we should chase. Now, what causes food allergy? We really don't know. So that's the status right now. Has anybody yeah. looked at the difference between natural vitamin D, like giving people light therapy versus supplementing them with? Yeah, so that's, I love, I'm so glad you asked that question. I always think, ah, oh, I should have said that. Well. <laughs> um, which is a question is about uh, the difference between UV light and with taking a pill. And um, there, you know, I, when, I, when I think about what the impact of the sun is, you know, part of it has got to be vitamin D. We've, we've found that, we know it's real, and you know, clearly vitamin D has effects. If you take huge doses, you become hypercalcemic and sick, and we can prevent rickets, and now we're seeing that we can probably enhance the immune system in some way to prevent infections. And, so the, here's the question, which is, you know, in science, there's a rich history of reductionism, right, which is characterized by fruits and vegetables are good in many studies against cancer. And you know what's in fruits and vegetables? Beta carotene. And so we're going to do a big trial showing that beta carotene prevents cancer. Oops, beta carotene does not prevent cancer. Let's go back to fruits and vegetables. Fruits and vegetables prevent cancer. So I do worry that at some level, vitamin D is like a is a marker of sunlight exposure and that a lot of the things that we're looking at are vitamin are the sun hitting the skin and creating vitamin D and maybe vitamin X Y and Z that we haven't discovered yet and so then we're charging ahead with our vitamin D studies oh it's null is it because you didn't measure X Y and Z or give X Y and Z very possible but you still want to do those trials but think of it this way, that if you do, if you see all this observational data, it looks convincing, and then you do the trial and you give the vitamin D, and you try all the different doses and the baseline levels and all that complexity, there's still nothing there. Then think about X, Y, and Z. But other times you'll do it and it works. Then it was at least that part of the benefit was vitamin D. So it's gonna be a mix of those. My guess is that sun conditions will be largely sunlight related to things that we haven't captured, and others will be actually vitamin D. And if you just give the supplement, it's just as good. Last question. Is the ARI effect purely felt to be due to cathelicidin, or is there any effect on humoral or cellular immunity? 
The question is, is the ARI effect purely thought to be due to cathelicidin, or could there be other effects on um, cellular or humoral immunity? And there are certainly many effects on, on other parts of immunity. I just brought up the cathelicidin because I think, I do think that it is the key to the answer, which is all of the other bacteria around, and specifically the microbiota, this whole idea about the microbiome, which we're hearing more and more about. Uh, in the current issue of Jackie, we have an RCT that shows that in Mongolia, giving kids vitamin D improved their atopic dermatitis. Now, these were kids chosen in Mongolia, so you know they're really low, that had winter-related atopic dermatitis, which means that, hello world, my atopic dermatitis gets worse when the sun disappears. So I'm like stacking the deck, trying to find the kids who are low, who tell you the sun matters, we give them vitamin D, it works. Randomized double-blind control trial in this issue of Jackie. How does that work? I bet it works through catalysis induction of the skin, changing the flora of the skin, which then improves the atopic dermatitis. And so that's gonna be a theme in the airway in a way that we don't understand yet. How is the respiratory microbiome changing according to vitamin D status? And what is that doing to susceptibility to different viruses? Um, there are, you know, again, cellular humoral aspects to this, but I think the, the antimicrobial peptide microbiome pathogen story is the most compelling. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.